Hi folks, on this video we are going to have a look at the real thing in order to get some factual information about this idiosyncratic helmet. This one in particular is the American model 1917. We basically know that because the interior design is different from the British version and because this marking, this stencil bar, defines it as the helmet of an American lieutenant. This kind of helmet was designed by John L. Brody in 1915. That's why Brody is the generic name that defines this helmet. However, if we want to name it correctly, a Brody helmet just refers to the first 1915 version. For the modifications in 1916, turned it into the Mark I in Britain and model 1917 in the United States. As you can see, after more than 100 years, the surface of this helmet is quite shiny. This is due to the fact that this is the early version of the helmet. Soon, it was noticed that on the battlefield, these helmets were too shiny and could be quickly identified. That's why a coat of asbestos and dull paint was added on later production. Now we need to go to the warning part. Asbestos is a very dangerous material and to own or manipulate a brady helmet with an asbestos coat is very dangerous. You will notice the presence of this material because you will see a grainy surface. And after 100 years sometimes part of that coat is usually cracked. If that's the case, the only way of display and preservation should be in a museum inside a protected atmosphere. Therefore, from a modeling perspective, if you want to represent a Brady helmet from the First World War, you must take into account that the first Mark I helmets were shiny, uh, like this one, and had an olive green coat. Then in 1917, they were painted in khaki, like this one here, and later, during that year, they received the asbestos treatment with khaki paint. If you want to represent a late war helmet, you have to use a grainy surface treatment before painting. Maybe that's not entirely necessary on such a small scale as 135th, but definitely it's a must if you are dealing with larger scales. In this particular case, uh, you have here khaki brown color, quite shiny, shapes are a bit irregular, and they look like they are part of the original metal cast though there is some battle damage as well, here. These helmets were made with a single sheet of metal which was pressed to get the characteristic salad bowl shape. It has a rim and several rivets that hold the lining. The chin strap, as you see here, is made of brown leather and it has quite a big buckle. If you're portraying an American helmet, don't forget that, as in this case, rank was marked here at the front. Let's turn it upside down. This part distinguishes it from the British Mark I. The American helmet has an inside band with little cuts. As you see here, inside each cut, there's a little rubber roll. Let's have a look at one of them. Well, you will need to represent that as a modeler, but then if you are portraying the helmet upside down, make sure you depict the primary sweatband here, which covers almost the whole inside surface. It's made of leather and it has a shiny black look. This net was adjusted with a cord to fit the head. Bear also in mind that on both the American and British versions, the chin strap goes all the way up here and its link below the apex. This donut rubber ring protects the top of the head. From a modeling perspective, these insides are quite difficult to reproduce. However, from a lounge or a flea perspective, such complexity must have been like Disneyland. I don't know what you think, but between these hygienic liner issues and the asbestos bed, it doesn't look like the most fortunate design. So, in conclusion, from a modeling perspective, what do we have to bear in mind when depicting a First World War brother? 
It Can Be Green in 1916 and Khaki after that. You can paint them shiny, which would represent earlier versions, or texturize with a grainy surface after 1917. And remember too that if you are depicting American officers, you mustn't forget rank markings. The insides are a mess, full of different materials, but uh, representing a thick black leather band can simplify it. Chin straps from this period were made of good thick leather. Whether these straps were usually tied around the chin is a matter of folklore and different myths in the First and Second World Wars. There was a widespread rumor that soldiers could get strangled by the chin strap after a blast. If somebody has additional knowledge regarding strap use or general information, please add a comment and share. Well, I hope this little analysis has been useful for you. Thanks for watching and see you on the next video. Bye.